Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Good morning. My name is Jay Kurtzer. I'm the interim director with the CSAS Humanitarian Agenda. On behalf of the Center for Strategic and International Studies, thank you for joining us online today. News from Khartoum is coming so quickly, it's almost hard to keep track. Nearly two years from the start of the street protests and approximately a year and a half from the overthrow of the regime of Pre Pre uh, President Omar al-Bashir, the rapid political developments are making people's heads spin. In the last few days, we saw the announcement from the White House to take steps to remove Sudan from the state sponsor of terrorism lists, negotiations around normalization with Israel, and just today, Sudan, Egypt, and Ethiopia are in negotiations around the Grand Renaissance Dam. Last week, the ICC prosecutor visited Khartoum to discuss trial options in the future of justice proceedings. The removal of the SST designation is an essential step for the interim government and for Sudan's transition. The explicit tying to Israel normalization surely complicates the matter. Now is a tenuous time for Sudan. Years of isolation under the previous regime have set back human and economic development. And the optimism that accompanied the overthrow of the previous government has run into a wall of economic, political, security, and now public health realities on top of existing and longstanding humanitarian concerns in the areas of ongoing conflict. Humanitarian needs in Sudan have risen throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. Historic flooding and rapidly increasing food prices present a vexing crisis. High inflation is making it more difficult to purchase food, and the worsening economic situation has sparked more street protests. In addition, the floods present a major humanitarian challenge, which hund with hundreds of thousands of homes destroyed and people at severe risk of waterborne disease. And yet, with all the optimism and rhetoric around Sudan's transition, humanitarian appeals remain critically underfunded. While the transitional government currently in power following Bashir's overthrow has lifted many of the restrictions on humanitarian access, many challenges also remain for local organizations to respond. So we're very grateful to our panelists today for joining us to discuss, to discuss some of these uh, emergency humanitarian issues, even while there's a lot of conversation about the very important political developments. First, we're thankful for Dr. Suleiman Baldo, uh, senior policy advisor at The Century, a nonprofit that focuses on corruption and the prevention and genocide crimes in East and Central Africa. He previously directed Sudan Democracy First and was the Africa Director at the International Center for Transitional Justice and a Crisis Group. We'll also be joined by Hala al karib Regional Director of the Strategic Initiative for Women in the Horn of Africa Network. Her work focuses on women's and girls' rights, as well as the challenges facing refugees and displaced persons. I'm also grateful to have Judd Devermont join this discussion. Judd is a director of the Africa program at CSIS and a lecturer at George Washington University's Elliott School of International Affairs. Thank you all for joining us and with sharing your time with us today. I'm gonna to start with Dr. Baldo, but before we go ahead, I wanna remind people that this session is meant to be interactive. So please feel free to submit your questions during the discussion using the Q&A function and we'll try to get to them time permitting. I wanna to turn to you now, Dr. Baldo. The interim government has taken some steps in increasing humanitarian access, including permitting the World Food Program to deliver aid to previously restricted areas in the South. However, a lot of restrictions still remain, despite government declarations to the contrary. Impediments to access are particularly worrying given the summer flooding. So I wanna ask you, what are the prospects for the transitional government to create a fully permissive environment for international assistance agencies and how can the international community empower this process, particularly within the civilian agencies managing the humanitarian assistance? Over to you, Dr. Valdo. Uh, thank you for having me. And uh, let me start by saying that there is uh, definitely, and now under the transitional government, a definite political will to make of Sudan an environment that is permissive for humanitarian access. However, we are dealing with the legacy of 30 years of subverting humanitarian assistance, manipulating it. You know, the philosophy of the Islamist regime is that uh, international humanitarian organizations or agencies are in this country for no good. They have their 
agenda. They have the cultural model that present contrary to our own model of the modern Islamist state. And therefore we will use them to our purposes and until we develop our own capacity to deal with uh, humanitarian relief and organization. Therefore, it's not just a question of, uh, uh, you know, the logistics of making access uh, work, but also a question of dismantling three decades of this mentality that has infused the, all the mechanisms in government and in the state uh, dealing with the management of humanitarian access. Let me give you some few examples. There are serious offers underway uh, to dismantle the largest Islamist, and I'm not saying Islamic, but Islamist relief organizations. And the most affected are IARA, International African Relief Agency, and Dawa Islamia, Islamic Call, who had also, you know, they, they acted like holding relief organizations with subsidiaries specialized by area, and who were pushed by the government as the preferred partner for international humanitarian interventions. Now these organizations are under a lot of scrutiny and because of also they went into political action and into uh, all forms of grand corruption uh, for regime insiders operating under this uh, relief organization. So th there is a serious effort to, to dismantle this forced uh, intermediary interna in international par partners. There is an effort also to reform Sudan, uh, Sudanese Society of Red Cross uh, it's a membership association in Sudan, and it has been taken over systematically from the first year of the regime by engineering elections to its chapters. Uh, so this is now being reversed, and and uh, you know we are hopeful that Sudanese Red Cross and Red Cross, which is the largest uh, voluntary organization operating in this field, uh, with uh, regional and you know uh, local chapters across the country. Uh, there is also the dismantling of OCHA, the, you know, the uh, government agency, sorry, uh, HAC, uh, the Humanitarian Action uh, you know, uh, Commission. It was not a regulatory agency of international uh, work and civil society space in Sudan. It was an extension of the National Intelligence and Security Services during Bashir in this space. Uh, supervising and manipulating international relief operations, but also limiting civic space for local civil society organizations through surveillance, through intimidation, through diversion of assets. Many of the international, you know, uh, of the uh, Sudan's decision uh, to, to terminate the presence and operations of international NGO were, you know, very much driven also by corruption motives to take over the vehicles, the generators, their office equipment. And it was always hack. That's to say the National Intelligence and Security Services that took this over. So this is now being you know, dealt with you know, in terms of uh, re reform efforts. And there are the laws that govern the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the humanitarian space and the civic space. Uh, from the very few early months of the uh, transitional government, the Minister of Labor and Social Development has con, you know, consulted on one on one basis of civil, with civil society organizations and form bodies to reform all the laws that govern these two spaces. We now, you know, seven months or uh, you know, what is it now, <laughs> nine months later, this is what lockdown does to you. We have draft laws for, uh, you know, for the registration of national, uh, you know, organizations. Uh, for, uh, you know, the uh, employment of foreign employees in, in these organizations, for, you know, registration of network of, uh, you know, NGOs, and so on and so forth. And th these laws, you know, are supposed to be uh, enacted, adopted into law, but, you know, there is a lot of delay in this process given the, you know, the other priorities. So uh, I just want to say, it, it, you know, the, uh, Political will is backed by a huge effort of reform behind the scene that has yet to show results. But on the civilian government side, you can be assured that there is no failure of political will at this time. And the other major factor for government to cooperate with this is the enormity of the need and the incapacity of the government to deal with it. 
Thanks very much. I want to ask you, in, in July, you were quoted in, in a Voice of America article about the um, power sharing agreement, which is a subject of, of much speculation mm -hmm. and sort of the key to, to the ongoing process that um, you argue that Hamdok needs to bring the security forces under civilian control to gain control of the weapons and gain control of the money. And I'm, I'm just wondering, you talked about the civilian, um, the civilian side of the, of the process and made reference to the historic manipulation of the aid endeavor. So how have you seen the power sharing government effectively coordinating the ongoing humanitarian response? I mean, even prior to the latest news, um, earlier this year, USAID announced a, a package of, of nearly $350 million. So there have been um, substantial amounts of resources coming into the country. And how has the government managed that? And have internal politics impeded the delivery? Or do you still or do you see some improvement even while some of the historic challenges remain? Well, here again, you have because of the nature of the transition and the power, you know, power sharing arrangements in place. I mean, the, the, the mindset is different in the security component of the transition and the civilian component on the transition. The civilian component has political will to reform humanitarian access, but has little, uh, you know, resources, uh, you know, to, to, to make this happen, particularly at this man after dismantling what the previous uh, regime had in terms of intermediary humanitarian organizations. Uh, on the government, the on the military component side, uh, particularly in conflict areas, which are still under a state of emergency, a state of uh, siege, and uh, you know, the security committees are very much in control in these situations, the, you will find still uh, you know, the same set mindset uh, of security prioritizing the manipulation, the access or denial of access based on agenda that are beyond humanitarian needs of, of the concerned communities and populations. Uh, people have to be watch, uh, watching out for this uh, and, and basically trying to rely on you know, whatever basically local uh, civilian authority is there to neutralize the, you know, the reactions that are routine in, in the, you know, the, the military and security component. Uh, in managing uh, humanitarian access on the ground. Um, so, I mean, this is, this is a complex situation. It, it, you know, it would require discerning these nuances at the local level and you know, navigating them uh, to the benefit of uh, you know, populations that are in need. Uh, thanks. I, I want to take you back to the report you wrote earlier this year, um, Lone Wolves. Um, you wrote about um, deep-rooted corruption um, threatening Sudan's financial health and, and the transition. And, and we spoke a little bit yesterday about how corruption impacts the humanitarian response. H how do you see, um, how should international donors consider this question uh, when thinking about the delivery of both, you know, the, the emergency humanitarian assistance, but also um, what looks to be a, a large amount of financial assistance coming in in the aftermath of the announcements of this past week. Are there steps that can be taken to more effectively manage this response, given all the uh, variables that you've uh, previously mentioned uh, this morning? I think the most effective tool to really ensure that uh, this, uh, you know, influx of, of humanitarian assistance and funding for such is not manipulated for, uh, you know, uh, by, by corrupt actors is really to, uh, you know, advise the largest operators, the UN humanitarian agencies and international organizations uh, to make sure that the partners are, you know, in compliance with Sudanese laws and in particular tax laws uh, that they are registered, that they are paying their taxes and are, you know, have financial visibility to the competent authorities, revenue collection or tax authorities or customs authorities in the country. If you establish a white list of operators who are in compliance, it will be very soon uh, a very effective tool for eliminating gray companies. That is to say, even if these companies are government owned, they may be you know, in, in violation uh, of uh, existing Sudan laws 
uh, for the transparency of their revenue and the control and oversight of the Ministry of Finance uh, of, their, uh, of, of their operations. And therefore that would be, uh, you know, like uh, know your uh, client uh, approach in the banking sector, humanitarian, uh, you know, agencies need to know, in particular for large scale bulk transportation operations, but also for subcontracting, you know, infrastructure building for, or, or, you know, uh, any local level uh, intervention with significant financing. Um, I want to take it a little bit big picture and, and put to you two, two questions. I mean, first is, regardless of the reality of how it has manifested, humanitarian aid is meant to be short term by nature. Um, we, you know, we've seen in, in parts of the southern parts of Sudan, humanitarian organizations um, with restrictions and not have worked for, for many, many years. And so the one question I want to ask you is about um, your sense of the transitional government's ability to respond to the economic crisis, right? I mean, you have the conflict affected humanitarian um, situations, you have the floods, now you have COVID and the economic instability. Um, but big picture, can, can this government, you know, does it have the capacity to take the steps to, to resolve the economic crisis? Um, and then the second question I want to ask you is on on issues about justice and accountability. But maybe I'll I'll let you ask, answer the first one, and then I'll come back to to the second question. Well, the economic crisis has been deteriorating all along, and this is because the you know the civilian government doesn't have the tools uh, to respond to this uh, economic crisis, and it has be, been denied these tools. Uh, on the anniversary of his swearing in of his cabinet in in, in, in September. Uh, Prime Minister Hamdouk addressed the nation saying that his ministers control only 18% of public funds in the country. And the next day he also made another statement that uh, it's a priority for the government to take control and subject you know, corporations owned by the defense and security agencies to the oversight of the Ministry of Finance. This is the problem you have. Because these corporations, and until they are brought under the oversight of the Ministry of Finance, have denied the civilian government the access to their revenues that would have allowed it to start managing the structural deformities in the macroeconomy uh, of Sudan. And they have been backed in this effort by their regional backers, in particular the United Arab Emirates, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and, and Egypt, who would want to see Sudan. Uh, in a situation like that in Egypt with effective and real control for the military and, and uh, sort of a token uh, facade of uh, democracy and of civilian government. So that internal and external economic pressure is what has accounted uh, for the inability and failure of the civilian government to really introduce any meaningful relief to the hardship the population continued to, to, to face the severe shortages in the social communities and the inability to implement its decisions about macroeconomic uh, reforms, uh, such as the lifting of subsidies on, on fuel and, and, all, uh, and all of the rest. Uh, now with the SSTD listing, the government would have more control on some resources. And I believe it has an opportunity to begin uh, addressing uh, you know, the reform of the economy with some impact, but this should be a window of opportunity to address the core problem uh, of bringing the gray economy under control and basically eliminate it altogether. Otherwise, Sudan is going to be in, uh, in trouble for the long haul. Thanks for that. I'm going to pause on the justice question and turn now um, over to you, Hala. Um, thank you so much. Um, in, in some of his comments, um, Dr. Baldo referred to the importance of relying on, on local civilian authorities, particularly in navigating the dynamic in, in the power sharing agreement. Um, and you know, based on your work and your experience, can you talk a little bit about how and why the international community needs to tailor its assistance to focus more locally and what steps are needed to um, really build that capacity building at the local level to um, enable the long-term development. 
Thank you so much um, uh, for your questions. Um, I'd, I'd like to stress um, first that, you know, um, aid is a form of interventions, um, you know, and, and, and for this reason, you know, um, it needs to take into consideration all the complexities of the politics on the ground. Sudan currently is um, under a very, um, um, is, is living through, uh, is, is very volatile, you know, and, and, and the situation is extremely, um, um, very, very sensitive. The country is going through a very deep transitions. But going through that, you know, um, um, also with um, an extremely limited um, uh, capacity and, 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 and limited um, ability, you know, um, in terms of uh, our governance system. Um, the fact that the country has been under the control of the Islamists and living in isolation from the rest of the world for 30 years, you know, um, that added a lot to our vulnerabilities and, and, and so on. So um, it's really very, very important, you know, for, for any aid operations, you know, sort of to understand the internal dynamic and um, so as not to cause, you know, and, and to be extremely conflict sensitive. So as not to cause further frictions you know, and to be extremely also strategic in terms of, you know, uh, what what type of aid does Sudan need at this point of time, you know, and when is he, uh, um, and 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 do we need actually, uh, um, you know, um, aid and relief, or we need, um, you know, a sort of a mix operation between aid and 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 development, you know, um, and 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 so on. So those are all um, elements that I think we have to we have to take into consideration. The other important aspect that I think it's really very very important, you know, the miserable conditions of our um, uh, uh, government structures, you know, from local governments all the way to central governments. And I think you know, learning from the past and the lessons that we have seen. I mean, I work in different countries around the Greater Horn of Africa alienating local government and, and keeping them as observers, you know, during um, aid operation, that also uh, causes a lot of tensions. And uh, while the partnership with, um, with local government and engagement of, of them and give them a sense that they are a part of the process of rehabilitation of the country, um, it's, uh, it's something that's very, very critical. Um, the way I see it, I, I think Sudan, I, I think aid and relief is very limited uh, wordings to the situation in Sudan. I think what Sudan needs, you know, it needs uh, some sort of restructural rehabilitation at this point of time, you know, um, because as I said, you know, um, it's over 30 years of isolation. So the decaying is happening across you know, the structures of uh, being um, a government structure or even civil society and NGOs. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Uh, you um, wrote in 2018 a piece where you talked about the uh, NGOization of civil, civil space in the Horn. Um, can you talk a little bit about that concept, which I think has taken increased resonance in the you know, in the past few years, there's been this conversation about localization of humanitarian assistance. Um, the rhetoric has outpaced the action. Um, and in the past six months, in, in the context of um, social justice movements stemming from Black, Black Lives Matter, the humanitarian community has focused a lot on what it means for international organizations to come into um, other contexts and impose their ideas of what, what is needed. So. Can you talk a little bit about this idea of NGOization and then how it manifests in Sudan and what donors and advocates can do to ensure it doesn't happen? Well, the isolation, I mean, the idea of NGOization is definitely based on the isolation of, you know, any form of assistance or support operations from, you know, the, re the realities on the ground and of from what's uh, and, and the politics on the ground from what's actually 
needs to take place. And I think Sudan, you know, the Sudan revolution has given a very clear model, you know, for um, the fact that, you know, despite often, you know, um, um, uh, international actors, they undermine, you know, the internal dynamics and its capacity to, you know, to lead transformations that ultimately it is the will of the people on the ground who can make things happen. You know, so so basically, um, um, and 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 we all remember that you know when the transition happened in Sudan, it came as a shock for so many um, of you know some of the organization that's been present in Sudan for years. Nobody saw that happening. The level of organization, the sophistications of you know how young people and women came together and they managed really to work through the repression of Bashir's regime. You know, so, so, so basically, you know, transforming every aspects of, you know, of our development and of our growth and transition into a, a typical NGO structure, it's proven to be a failure everywhere in this region. Actually, it's reproducing, you know, the crisis um, um, and, and, and things like that. And I keep saying that we are tired of having empty rooms sold by the local communities that this is, was built to be a clinic. This was built presumably to be a school and, and, and things like that. You know, so I think the reality of the matter, the collaboration with, you know, the, the strategic engagement, the collaborations with two components of the society the, uh, the local government, and I think the local government are very, is very, very important component in Sudan to collaborate with. And the other thing, the collaborations with the civil society. When I say civil society, I'm talking about activists in the ground who actually prove to be effective and efficient in leading transformation when, when needed and, and utilize these powers you know, to create uh, uh, transformation at the local level, to process it, to strategize for, for support for the country, to plan developmental projects and things like that. You know, um, the other thing that I'd also like to talk about, you know, the tendency of depoliticizing it, you know, operations and assuming that it has nothing you know, at the local level, that it is so impartial and has nothing to do with the with the politics. That's one of the things that's actually affected the populations in this part of the world big time. Because if you are going to invest while you are not taking into consideration the type of politics that alienate or repress, you know, the local population, then any aid operation ultimately will not attain it's objective. Um, more or less, what I wanted to say is that, you know, extending support, you know, um, is part of a collaborative operations that should be happening between two parties. And, and, and I think, you know, while doing that, you know, equality and value populations and people voices. And when I say population, I'm not talking about the elites like myself or Dr. Suleiman who can sit in a webinar. I'm talking about the actual people on the ground, you know, who are actually uh, uh, benefits from this. And, and, and so their voices and how things, you know, how do they want things to get done is, is, is very critical. Yeah, thank you. Let, let me ask you, um... Uh, one one follow-up question. I mean, much of your work has been um, focused on the rights of women and girls in conflict-affected areas. Um, you talked about marginalized groups. You also talked about the groups of people that came together as part of the revolution. I think we all, you know, at least here in Washington, saw some incredible images of young Sudanese women being at the forefront of the, of the protest movement. Um, so, you know, I'd like to take a brief step back and talk about the ways in which the conflict and some of these, these processes have disproportionately affected women and girls. Um, and you know, today, this year is the 20th anniversary of the, the UN Security Council resolution on women, peace and security, um, which talked about um, acknowledging and empowering women to play more important roles in, in conflict prevention and peace building going forward. So you know, what gains have been made 
um, what opportunities are there now to seize on and capitalize on on that growth you know from the protest movement to transition to a, a better future so um you know a year back we were extremely optimistic right now we are totally overwhelmed you know and 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 you know to a large extent as as activists and as you know uh, uh, as being part of a, a women rights organization at the front line you know um not only overwhelmed but also frustrated um uh, over 50 percent of sudan populations are are women the number of uh, women who participated in Sudan revolution exceeded 65 percent um, I have been in the sitting literally every day at Khartoum sitting and by far the number of women you know during the day and at night is equal to men and sometimes it's more so Sudanese women they have invested significantly in these transformations and we did and we did that not randomly and not because we were following anyone but, but because Sudanese women understood that you know the political islamist has been undermining us has been treating us you know as a third and a second class citizen and we were every sudanese woman was fully aware of that injustice and they went through it and it happened across you know from the minute we woke up our dress code is controlled you know, the places we we look for work is control. The time we stay late is control uh, out late, and all these things. You know, unfortunately, you know, a year to the over a year to the revolution. You know, um, um, a year and three months, and nothing has happened. You know, actually, the level of violations against women is increasing in sudan by the minute and um uh, it's happening from uh from the militarized groups being militia or, or 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 police brutality and they are more emboldened and empowered by the fact that um, and i'm saying that it's very unfortunate that the transitional government still think that they can play the gender card you know by manipulating women issues you know, and putting them at the bottom of the list as something they can use to negotiate, you know, with the conservative forces. And, and that's such a shame. You know, we, in, in July 2020, the Minister of Justice has introduced a catastrophic amendment to the Criminal Act that endorses you know the Sudan. Uh, uh, you know criminal. Uh, criminal in, endorses criminalization of women. You know uh, women are still subject to punishment uh, for. Um, you know if they practice certain type of livelihoods. Um, they uh, the women prison in Khartoum. You know the level of detention and arrest is increasing by the minute. Um, and and we have uh, our personal status law is still endorses guardianship. You know, child marriage is still uh, happening in Sudan. Um, uh, Sudan is one of the countries that has one of the worst, um, you know, uh, uh, matrimonial laws, inheritance and succession laws, where women are completely impoverished and deprived from accessing land, accessing properties, accessing resources equally. So it's extremely grim and miserable um, uh, for women. And, and, and this is very, very unfortunate. We are still, you know, Sudan has been delisted, but we are still one of three countries, um, in addition to uh, your country, the United States, who signed CEDU but did not ratify it. But we are one of three countries in the world, in, um, in addition to Iran and Somalia, who did not ratify CEDU, the Convention of Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women in the World. You know, we did not, Sudan is still did not and resent the ratification of the African Protocol on the Rights of Women. So it's uh, it, it's it's very much a struggle, you know, for uh, for women and girls in, in in this country. Very unfortunate. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Th
that. Thank you um, for, for highlighting that. I think it's an important piece of the puzzle. You know, in, in the humanitarian and development community, we talk about the you know, sort of the, the triple nexus and the, the aid and, and development and, and peace building. I want to turn back to you, Dr. Baldo, um, the question that I flagged earlier. One of the steps in, in transition processes is also about accountability and, and justice for the past. So, uh, you know, with the visit um, of the ICC prosecutor to Khartoum last week, uh, what do you see as the prospects for uh, accountability um, for the previous regime, and do you see that as a potential flashpoint going forward, or is it a necessary step in, in Sudan's transition to have a meaningful accounting of, of crimes of the past? And I ask you to unmute, please. It's definitely a, a priority for the you know youth movements, women movements, who were the main actors in the change in Sudan who were you know, the, uh, uh, basically the organizers and the motors of change during the revolution of 2018, 2019. And key among their demands, you know, they, they, they summarize this in three, you know, justice is the first, peace and freedom. Basically, these are the three uh, demands. It has been a struggle to meet the agenda for the um, justice uh, priority. Uh, there are investigations underway for the violence that occurred during the suppression of the revolution in which many people were killed, and particularly the Khartoum massacre. Everyone knows that Sudanese security and defense agencies are the culprits. You know, this was a major operation, not a, a basically a rogue operation. And many agencies of the state cooperated in the violent uh, attack on civilian unarmed protesters who were uh, you know, uh, participating in the sitting uh, during the June 3rd uh, massacre. Uh, we don't have answers yet. You know, this is a major demand for justice. And for all the earlier episodes during which dozens of people were killed by the NIS and by the rapid support forces, and there is no yet any uh, signs of accountability. Uh, and therefore, uh, this constitutes uh, a major frustration. Uh, you refer in the, uh, the paper introducing this webinar to protests by the population. Uh, these protests are organized around particular themes, uh, unique themes each time. And one of them has been justice first. Go back to the agenda of justice and uh, you know, uh, respond to, to this. Uh, justice has been, you know, again served uh, as a, you know, a functional, pragmatic uh, plate uh, in the form of pursuing the officials of the former regime, and therefore that's why we have seen Bashir and his entourage brought to court, uh, various on charges of corruption. Now for the organization of the uh, 1989 coup d'état against an elected government, but not, you know, members of the security committee of that regime who are now in power that have committed atrocities in the past or during the suppression attempts or who continue to do so. One outrageous example is that the rapid support forces with no mandate or legal recognition to do so does have, you know, uh, you know detention cells of its own and its agents, you know, arrest and detain people out of any legal framework for that. And we haven't seen any you know, forceful response uh, from the government. So a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of works need to be done again in the area of uh, justice, uh, starting with legal reforms. Uh, Hala has highlighted some of these reforms that remain to be done. Uh, in the area of criminal justice, we still have a criminal justice law that uh, you know, is uh, basically uh, you know, with, with interventions of Sharia law in, in the section on punishments that remain in the books. And, and that has to be, you know, totally reformed. And again, this is uh, taking too long uh, for, for those uh, who are demanding justice, which is basically the entire population. Thanks. Um, Hala, before we turn to Judd and, and wrap up the event, I mean, 
we we talked about a lot of the challenges and and you talked about the optimism turning to a feeling of being overwhelmed to feeling of frustration um what what gives you optimism on a daily basis i mean what what signs do you see um you know, it's it's interesting to hear this because you know if you would read the Washington papers and read some of the narratives, everyone's saying, oh, you know, a new day has dawned, right? You know, the, the delisting has, and I think um, nuanced analysis suggests, well, it's complicated, and pessimistic analysis says, you know, it's it's not always a net positive when lots of money flows into a country. There's a lot of opportunities for things to go uh, pear shaped, as we say here. But I mean. There has to be something that still brings you optimism. So, what what are the things we should be looking for? Um, who are the people we should be engaging? Who should we be reaching out to from from the Washington side? I, th I think what definitely um, you know um, helped me to feel um, uh, optimistic and and you know I'm positive about Sudan. You know this time particularly. You know um, is. Uh, the, the level of awareness. Um, I, I really think that, you know, Sudanese people are every day demonstrating, you know, um, wisdom and awareness and a very good understanding that despite the brutality, I mean, if you are watching the news of Sudan, what's happening in Darfur every day, what's happening in Nuba Mountains, you know, the uh, the, the tribal tensions and the, you know, in Eastern Sudan, but every time Sudanese people, they rise above those tensions and they bend their heads and they show that, you know, peace requires wisdom and they respond, you know, um, um, you know to the calls for peace. And that's really, it's, it's very telling. And it shows that overall across this country, um, regardless of our different cultural backgrounds, you know, we are very much interested in reaching some sort of a formula that will help us um, to live together in peace. And, and I think that's really a very critical and important component that um, it should be looked at, you know, in any strategic engagement. Um, with, uh, uh, with Sudan, because I, I think this why it's very rare to find, you know, such a diverse group of people, you know, but in principle, ultimately, despite all the polarization, the pain and the cruelty that's currently happening, they sort of reach a level of understanding that we, we need to find a way to make to make, you know, uh, to reach some sort of governance that work, you know, to make this country work. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I want to now turn to uh, my colleague here at CSAS, um, Chad Devermont, the, the director of our Africa program, um, to share uh, some of your thoughts. Chad, you've spent a lot of time um, paying attention to US policy um, towards Africa. And so, Following the news, um, following today's conversation, could you just give us uh, your thoughts on, on the ongoing transition um, and some of the challenges and opportunities that, that our panelists today have raised? Sure, thanks, Jake. Uh, it's been a, a real treat to, to be part of this conversation, to learn uh, from my fellow panelists. I've been furiously writing notes. Um, you know, we're having a conversation today about humanitarian issues, but for me, ultimately, these are issue of politics, right? We can talk about SST, we can talk about the normalization with Israel, and I certainly do agree with Dr. Baldo that there is a window of opportunity, right? That I think the transition has a fighting chance now that some of these 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 conversations were moving beyond. But ultimately, I think we have to manage expectations. I think you heard that today. Um, because these sort of big foreign policy decisions, we're not gonna see the dividends of that in the short term, just in terms of the processes that they require to sort of both unlock the Sudanese economy um, and then sort of create you know, actual investments, et cetera. And so for me, what is going to be critical for a, a successful transition in Sudan, right? Ultimately, it's gonna be about the health of the economy. It's gonna be about the restoration of freedoms it's going to be about what we're talking today, the successful opening of the humanitarian space. And, and these factors 
plus of course the subordination of the military to civilian rulers are gonna be the most important. So I just wanna draw out a couple of things that I heard today that I'm taking with me um, in terms of challenges. One is how do you dismantle the negative elements that have sort of constrained and hindered humanitarian access without you know, having negative effects? How do you create a new uh, enabling environment where the to-do list for the transitional government is so long and so lengthy? How do you, and I think we kind of got at this, but it's, it's one of the most interesting parts about the humanitarian space and disaster relief right now. How do you manage the competition between the civilians, let's just say embodied by, by Hamdak and the military, again, for just ease of conversation embodied by Hametzi and Barhan? Right? Both, I think both sides understand the importance of being responsive or perceived as being responsive. I think that's how they're seeing legitimacy. But we have to be aware of that because as Dr. Baldo said, there are ulterior motives specifically for the military, but both of them are competing right now. Who can respond to flooding? Who can respond to humanitarian, excuse me, humanitarian access? It's really important that we understand what's in the humanitarian space is not just about getting assistance to people who are in desperate need, but it's also a contestation around credibility and legitimacy. And then finally, and Hala's points here were so important. What is the role of the international community? What type of aid does Sudan need? And how do we ensure it's used wisely? And all of this underscores my favorite point, which is sometimes lost here in these conversations between technocrats and specialists, although not today, I think everyone's been fantastic, but we're not working outside of politics, right? We all have this shared goal, it's humanitarian access, but we really do have to think about the political ramifications and accept not fight the reality that we're making politics by these interventions. So just a couple of questions for us to think about. What actors are in the lead? Who is granted the right to deliver assistance? I'm talking about domestic actors here. What communities are gaining or losing access in this process and what are they receiving? And then finally, how do these activities benefit competitors, the military, civilians, et cetera, in the transition? And I think if we keep that in the back of our minds, we'll be working within the stream of politics as opposed to pretending that we're outside of it, which I think often is a very dangerous sort of mindset. So thanks again, Jake, for having me. Thanks, Judd. I think that's a, that's a great wrap up. And, and um, as with most of these events, I think we leave with more questions you know, than, than answers, but um, I just want to say um, thank you very much to um, you, Hala, um, you as well, Dr. Baldo, uh, for joining us today, but also for the work that you're doing uh, with your respective organizations at the local level, at the international level. We appreciate it. Thanks, Judd, for being a good colleague. And uh, thank you all for joining us today. Um, we look forward to seeing you online at our next event. I uh, wish you a good afternoon. Thank you very much. <laughs>